Uh, I have one declaration to make. I'm not a physicist, so I will bring you back to the shallow water uh, for this presentation. Uh, I can assure you of that. Um, how many, by show of hands, were here last year at the, at the DOE Symposium? So a few. Um, I would like to say thank you to Landauer for hosting this because, frankly, the, the information that I got here last year was very relevant, uh, very timely, and uh, actionable, which is important for me, and frankly, informed and inspired some of the work that we've done over the last 12 months, that coupled with conversations I'd had with Olaf. So again, my hat's off to, to Landauer for making this uh, very relevant and, and for me, very actionable. As Olaf said a little bit about LifePoint, we were founded in 1999. Uh, we're based out of Brentwood, Tennessee, which is a suburb of Nashville. Um, originally a spinoff of HCA, for those of you familiar, Hospital Corporation of America. Um, I was with that company for 25 years before and have been with LifePoint for the last nine years. Uh, we have 72 hospitals. Uh, your handout says 76. That's really 76 locations relative to CT. There are 72 actual hospitals located in 22 states. Uh, and we're uh, fairly, as you can see on the map, geographically diverse. Uh, we cross the country from Nevada to the Carolinas, uh, from Texas, Georgia, Alabama, up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So again, quite uh, geographically diverse. We are fully accredited by the Joint Commission, and our um, goal is we're committed to keeping health care local in our communities. I think it's um, important that we talk a bit about our mission because everything that I do when I develop strategic plans are, uh, annually for the service lines that I'm responsible for or uh, anything that we do as a company, uh, we, we, we center on our mission of making communities healthier. and. Um, our high five guiding principles, one of which is to deliver high quality patient care. So an outline of what I want to cover with you today, uh, I want to go over why dose optimization. You've heard that all um, over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, why now, but specifically why dose optimization and why now for LifePoint? Uh, what was our organization and process to sort of launch this work? What were, some of, what were the results from some of the standardization efforts? And then a brief discussion of some of the challenges that we had as an organization. Uh, you've seen these pictures uh, over the last couple of days, and you've seen them um, uh, many times before, I'm sure. Uh, the media uh, has, been, has been quite prevalent in the media, what's happened in radiation dose over the last few years, and I think it's driven uh, the why now. Uh, but I'm curious, and um, if you're not comfortable raising your hand, don't, but how many of you have actually seen patients like this? Probably not a lot of us. I've done this for, for a few years, and I've only seen it a couple of times. Um, and it's patients that had come in to see us that had been in other places, and uh, it was clear that the, the, the physical damage or harm they had received had been uh, from exposure to radiation. So um, as we heard from Kyle earlier, as we heard from Dr. Samé yesterday, uh, we should always focus on first do no harm. And for me, having been in this field for, again, a long time, um, Relative to radiology, there are two things that I've always focused on with my staff uh, in the way of hit what I call hidden harms. Um, and that's things that uh, may harm or cause physical injury to the patient that's not immediately apparent. Uh, a lot of the hospital acquired conditions or a lot of the harms that patients uh, experience in the healthcare setting today uh, are immediately um, apparent if they have a hip fracture while in the hospital or if they acquire a bloodstream infection or things that, uh, that happen to them in the hospital setting are physical harm or threat uh, that they didn't come to the hospital with. But what about those things that aren't so um, immediately apparent? What about uh, contrast dose, radiopaque contrast material dose uh, and, and the effect that it has on the kidney after the patient leaves? That's often not as acute as we think it is. Um, that can ha be a more long-term um, harm. Same with radiation. Uh, that can be a longer-term harm as well. So again, why now? Uh, Olav has shared and others, the, uh, the studies prove that the risk of radiation uh, increases the risk of cancer in patients. In 2013, been shared with you that the AAPM published guidelines on CT protocol management and review. 
Um, as we heard from Andrea yesterday, uh, the Joint Commission published in 2015 their diagnostic imaging standards which address CT dose. Uh, Olav mentioned MACRA and MIPS this morning. Uh, for the providers, the size of the payment adjustment that they'll receive will depend on the data they submit and the quality of that data. And there we go. 60% um, of that payment incentive is uh, quality related, and you can see some of the examples of radiation um, optimization or dose reduction strategies from a quality standpoint here. Is there anyone in the room from CMS? Is anyone familiar with the CMS or the United States Department of Health and Human Services Partnership for Patients? Has anyone heard of it or has anyone participated in that partnership or in the hospital engagement network? Okay, I'll share a little bit about that work with you because, again, it sort of was the uh, framework that we used for some of the work that we did at LifePoint. So when you hear me reference the HEN work, um, we're talking about the hospital engagement network, and that's part of the um, federal government's par partnership for patients. So the goal of that partnership was um, a grant that called for a 20% reduction in all-cause patient harm and a 12% reduction in 30-day readmissions as a population-based measure. Um, and there were a list. There was a list of 97 hospital-acquired conditions, and uh, the radiation dose is not one of those hospital-acquired uh, conditions. Just for your reference, and I listed just a few of the 97 here. So LifePoint's HEN history. Uh, back in 2011, uh, LifePoint was selected as one of 26 initial HEN partners across the country, and LifePoint was the only investor-owned. Uh, healthcare organization that was awarded uh, a grant from the federal government. So we became at that point a uh, government contractor. So there were some things that we obviously had to do uh, to to, uh, to become a, a contractor for the federal government. Some of the hen results, and if you recall, it was a twenty. It called for a twenty per, twenty percent reduction in all cause patient harms. We experienced a forty seven percent reduction in pressure injuries. 51% uh, reduction in bloodstream infections through the course of this work, 87% uh, decrease in early elective deliveries. And this is really important because you can see graphically here over the three-year grant that LifePoint was able to achieve a 43.7% reduction in all harms, which again far exceeded the goal that CMS had set for the partnership. Uh, as a result of that work, LifePoint was recognized by the federal government as the top performing HEN for that three-year period or the top performing hospital engagement network. Uh, consequently, we were selected to participate in what was known as um, Hospital Engagement Network uh, 2.0 or HEN 2.0. It was a much narrower performance period, so we only had one year to show improvement. And the goal, based on LifePoint's prior performance, was a 40% reduction in hospital-acquired harms, and I've listed some of the new harms that were targeted in, in HEN 2.0. Uh, why this is relevant to the conversation today is we as a company, um, me specifically, chose radiation safety as one of the additional voluntary topics. Uh, it wasn't something that they had listed, again, as one of the 97 hospital-acquired harms, but something that we felt we could use the framework that we had developed to drive imp uh, improvement as an organization. I applied effectively uh, to radiation optimization. Uh, the LifePoint Health HEN 2.0 plan, I point this out because I want to show you some of the methods that are used because you saw in tw being in 22 states and we're centrally located in Nashville, Tennessee, it can be pretty hard to drive those improvements. So some of the methods that we used that we subsequently employed in our dose optimization work included learning collaboratives and quick wins from those learning collaboratives. We had both facility and regional patient safety officers and subject matter experts designated to some of the harm reduction. Uh, we had regional and uh, local patient safety meetings, and we had subcontracting partners in hospital communities to support uh, care transitions. And uh, that's important here because we used Landauer as our physics consultant. As you'll see um, our universe later, uh, it's challenging when you're dealing with more than 60 physics groups across the United States uh, to try to get consensus. So 
I wanted to deal with one. Uh, we looked at national providers that had presence across the United States and that had experience in the states in which we operate, and we ultimately chose to subcontract with Landauer. Um, these were the goals of the HEN relative to the radiation optimization or safety work that uh, I submitted to the federal government. I, I intentionally um, left these general. Um, they're not very specific in the way of giving a percentage or a number because, frankly, we didn't know what we didn't know at the time. So our goal was to reduce, our, one of our objectives to the federal government was to reduce non-occupational radiation dose to CT patients by optimizing CT protocols. So again, the focus was on optimizing protocols. Uh, we gave a shout out to the Joint Commission and, um, and our, uh, one of our objectives was to comply with their 2015 uh, diagnostic imaging uh, requirements. Uh, very important to provide relevant education. We focused a lot of our efforts on educational collaboratives and what we could do uh, as a central organization to affect what was happening at the bedside in all the communities where we deliver care. Um, ultimately, develop and publish standard CT protocols for what we would later um, identify as high volume or high risk CT studies uh, to reduce variation and certainly support our mission as a company of making our communities healthier. So how did we really do this? Because again, trying to focus on uh, 72 hospitals, 76 locations across, across 22 states can be challenging. So the first thing we did, and you've heard this discussed, uh, Olav and team last year talked a lot about what does a uh, dose council look like? How are you reviewing protocols? Who, who should participate? So we developed an enterprise radiation dose optimization council. And when I say enterprise, that means representatives from across the company, both from our facilities and from the hospital support center, which is located again in uh, Middle Tennessee. I, I chaired that work along with uh, Olav as our contracted uh, physicist. We had eight imaging directors from LifePoint facilities from across the country who participated on that council. We had five CT technologists, many of which uh, had been application specialists in their past with uh, different equipment manufacturers. We had three uh, radiologists. We uh, asked for radiologists who had been thought leaders in dose optimization and who really had a focus on dose in CT, not just a radiologist who by nature of their contract was required to be named radiation safety officer in their hospital, but someone who truly had an interest in dose and what that meant to drive optimization uh, from a, a balance of uh, both uh, image quality and dose across uh, all of our hospitals. We had a representative from supply chain because they managed the relationship with our vendor partners, uh, clinical risk management, and then the director of regulatory and accreditation services for LifePoint, who uh, is also a joint commission surveyor, and he does all of the mock surveys in our hospitals to prepare them for um, Dr. Brown's team who comes in uh, for the, our triennial survey. So it was really probably more educational for him because this was early and the surveyors were just starting to get their education around uh, what those diagnostic imaging standards were. So we wanted to make sure to bring, bring him in. So he was a valuable member of that council as we move forward. So our first meeting was in July of 2016. We, we challenged or tasked that group with uh, developing what's the mission, what's the charter of this group, what do we want to accomplish? And it was quite simply identify or establish. And again, that's important to, to us because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So we wanted to look for or identify leading practices. If they didn't exist, we would establish them for our organization to achieve optimized radiation dose and image quality for LifePoint Health affiliated facilities. So fairly uh, succinct and fairly simple. Uh, I've listed what our objectives as a committee or council were initially. And then I really liked when I thought about this when I heard uh, Andrea yesterday speak of uh, robust process improvement. I really liked that term because that's what I looked at this as, or rapid improvement as I call it, but robust process improvement. I really like that. Again, just to review as a committee, as a council, as an organization, as a provider, what we were looking at in the way of LifePoint's universe. 
Again, seven, um, 76 locations across 22 states, uh, very geographically diverse. I've been in market situations before where I've had uh, some geographic synergy with a group of hospitals. That's not the case with LifePoint. Uh, when you, you talk to a hospital leader that's in Colorado one minute and the next minute, you're talking to one in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So the state regulations are quite different as well. So it's, it's very diverse from a location standpoint. At the time we started this work, we had 99 CT scanners that were included. Over 15 makes and models of CT scanners, although we work very hard as an organization to standardize equipment, processes, uh, supplies. Uh, we acquire hospitals and we typically don't replace every piece of equipment they have. So a uh, large majority of the uh, scanners that we have in our installed base are GE but we have over 50 makes and models that were included in this work. Some had dose reduction software, some didn't, some were brand new, uh, some were uh, not so new and quite old. Uh, all, had been, uh, all had been upgraded and were XR29 compliant. Another challenge uh, in our uh, work was we have over 60 different professional radiology groups, which represents hundreds of radiologists. Uh, we approach close to a million CT studies annually. We have several hundred CT technologists that work different uh, shifts and different schedules to educate. And we have multiple phys physics groups across the country. Let's talk a little bit about how we walked through this and how we started after our first uh, Enterprise Radiation Dose Council meeting. We launched the work with, a, with an educational collaborative. Uh, the focus of that collaborative uh, in, in, the, in who we invited were radiologists, uh, CT technologists, uh, specifically lead technologists and their staff, uh, imaging directors, and some of them invited their local physicists. So the first uh, uh, educational collaborative we had, I think there were just over 400 people on that, um, attended that event virtually. Um, and when we launched the collaborative, or when we launched the, the work, we focused on uh, optimizing protocols and not lowering dose, because that was a bit threatening, as you can imagine, to some of the radiologists. Um, and we didn't tell them, you're going to use this protocol. We, we explained how we would use the body of work and the information that we had from both uh, experience we had learned nationally, and in some cases the work that Olav and others were um, had access to that was international. So uh, we didn't want them to think we're going to take your protocol away and you're going to do it this way. Uh, and some of them had been working for many uh, months and years on protocol optimization so they could actually contribute to the work. Uh, the next step in the process was for us to establish a baseline or collect the data. Where are all of our CT scanners today? Uh, what was current practice. The uh, third step was to analyze that data and simultaneously start to de develop, based on what we learned, uh, standardized protocols for each of those make models of CT scanners. Uh, once that was done, we, w we hosted another very large educational collaborative to speak to what the phase one data collection had revealed and what those uh, standard protocols that had been developed for their CT scanner looked like and how to roll them out. Uh, then all sites were expected to review and implement the standardized protocols. They were to review them with their local physics team, uh, their radiologist, and their CT staff. And then uh, the final or uh, final phase in the process before we repeated was to uh, see what impact we had actually had. Um, and as I said, we did find some outliers in the data collection and we followed up or repeated as needed with those. This was the timeline we had initially put together. Um, when you look, some say that it is, um, I, I talked to a friend I met from Emory here and she does a protocol of the week, which is impressive to me. I thought doing the protocols that we did over a 90 day period was pretty aggressive. Uh, so it, I, I guess it's relative to uh, your situation and experience, but we started with that first learning collaborative the very uh, end of July of 2016, and 
uh, during that learning collaborative, we've learned, and, and at least in my experience, our team responds well to rapid improvement. So if you drag something out over a very long period of time, they lose interest or they become disengaged or there's a new priority of the day. So we really wanted to keep the work moving. So from my perspective, it was done quite rapidly. Uh, we had phase one data collection over a two week period. Uh, then we had a period of about 30 days to do data analysis and begin to develop the standard protocols. Uh, we then, after that work was done, had our next learning collaborative. And I'll show there was some work that was happening between there as well. So it wasn't just these very staged events, but these are the, the key, key dates in the process. Then the implementation of the standardized protocols and then we collected data uh, to see where uh, we had actually, how we had actually impacted performance. So the data collection process, uh, I said earlier that we were gonna focus on targeted protocols because you can't solve everything in, in one fell swoop. So we looked as an organization at what were our highest volume and uh, then we looked at what could potentially be high risk protocols. So when I looked at all the CT scans that were performed across our company, um, adult head, adult abdomen and pelvis, adult routine chest were by far the highest volume. And then we chose pediatric head and we defined it at the time as birth to one year old. Uh, I would do that differently now and as the data will show, we really pulled that out of the data set because it was so low volume. And we learned from the data collection that most of our hospitals had frankly focused on pediatric protocol development. So the pediatric protocols, they had spent a lot of time. When we looked at where the dose was for that population, it had already been optimized and the number of studies that we collected or data that we collected over the initial period was so low, it wasn't statistically significant. So uh, we really focused on those first three adult protocols that you'll see. The data collection uh, happened over a two week period initially or until you collected and submitted data for 20 exams per protocol. So that should have been around 60-ish exams for each hospital. And then you can see here some of the some of the data that we collected during the data collection process. This is just a screenshot of the manual entry spreadsheet. Uh, I know many of you have software, um, and I'll speak to what some of the challenges were to doing this manually, uh, but we had been evaluating and still are what would be an enterprise solution for our company to standardize on um, a dose tracking software. We have not decided what that will be yet. That's still being evaluated, but we didn't want to slow this work down. And frankly, I'll say, um, I'll say this a few times, and I've had this conversation with Olaf, and uh, the Landauer team uh, was very instrumental in the development of some of these tools, but I, pro I wouldn't do it any other way because I think as we launch this, the manual data collection truly engaged the staff at the, t at the CT technologist level and, and the CT leaders. Had we been pulling that data sort of behind the scenes and working on this, there would have been, a mu there would have been much less engagement at the facility level. So even though there were some challenges with doing this in a manual way, uh, I, I, again, I, I don't think I would do it differently if I had to, to do it again because it really engaged our staff in, in a way that um, had we been doing things in a more automated fashion, w it wouldn't have happened. Um, how did we report the data? Once they collected data on their CT, um, on each protocol, uh, each CT scanner, some hospitals obviously have multiple, that data was uh, submitted through uh, an FTP site and uh, we started the data uh, analysis at that time. Again, a review of the timeline once the data was collected. Uh, we started the analysis and protocol review. Uh, some considerations for data processing and analysis. It was limited to routine head, routine abdomen, pelvis, routine chest, all for the adult population. Uh, Non-routine studies were excluded. It was based on median CTDI. Uh, bolus tracking series were filtered out and we, we uh, you'll see in our ranges that we targeted a dose range of between the 25th and 75th percentile of the ACR dose index registry. Uh, why develop stan a standardized CT protocol library? I, I think here, and again, this was important to get buy-in from our radiologists because that was very, um, we, we didn't want them to really 
take a defensive posture. We wanted this to be collaborative. So we really uh, explained and educated and communicated that the goal of this project was to provide an optimal balance between dose and quality. Because as, as all of our speakers have articulated so well this week, uh, there is an equal or greater risk to, um, to having a, an image that's so noisy that you lose visibility of, of subtle pathology. So again, from the radiologist's perspective, from the clinician's perspective, and ultimately from the patient's perspective, uh, we had to maintain that balance. So that was very important as we went through this work. Again, these are just, this is a list of some of the uh, CT scanners that protocols were developed for. Uh, as, as Kyle pointed out, that was a challenge because no CT scanner is created equal. And some of ours, um, again, there are various vintages, various ages, different software revisions, different. Uh, some have um, Acer or iterative recon, some don't. So protocols uh, had to be developed for each one. So it's not a one size fits all, here's your head CT protocol. The, this is a screenshot of what our protocols look like. So when the, when the library, the standard CT protocol library was developed, uh, this is what was delivered to each facility uh, relative to their CT scan. And that protocol included what type of equipment that that protocol was for. So the make and model of the device, uh, including the equipment manufacturer, uh, the effective date of that protocol and any subsequent review or modification dates to the protocol. Clinical indications for that particular study, that uh, the patient's age and size, for that particular protocol, uh, uh, demonstration of patient positioning, any contrast material that's used in that protocol, uh, the, and of course the technical scan parameters, uh, the recons, and ultimately what the expected uh, dose index for that standard protocol would be. In addition to uh, the, uh, the webinars, I mean, I'm sorry, the educational collaborators and webinars that we held, we had a lot of other collateral that we did throughout the course of the 90-day uh, period that we provided FAQs, um, different links to research, uh, a lot of material to support their efforts locally. So when they had questions or if the CT staff had questions or if the radiologist had questions, they sort of walked through. So once we'd collected all the data, standard, um, standardized the protocols and published them to each of the facilities, um, this is uh, sort of a preview of the results we've had to date. Uh, over both phases of data collection, and again, this was manual, each of the hospitals submitted this data to the secure site. We were able to collect data from over 14,000 CT studies, and that was over a two-week period. Um, each hospital, uh, again, was expected to submit uh, for two weeks or once they had reached 20 of each protocol, you'll see some had submitted a much larger number of protocols during that period. Uh, some people just were very aggressive in their data submission. So uh, if one, if 20 is good, 400 is great. So they submitted them all. Um, and then there are others who were, who had enrolled as, uh, in Landauer CDOS program. So there were other protocols beyond the ones uh, in this HEN project that they were having evaluated. So they were submitting more protocols because of their um, expanded relationship uh, with clinical dose optimization and protocol review through uh, Landauer. This is just a high level summary uh, of how that broke out. There's around 75, just over 7,500 exams in phase one and uh, almost 6,800 exams in phase two. Uh, just to orient you a little bit to this graph if you look on the x-axis, that represents each individual hospital. Um, and then the y-axis is the median CTDI. And the two reference line, the lower being the, the 25th percentile of the, of the ACR dose index registry, the higher being the 75th percentile. So what this told us is there's wide variability in uh, the dose for head C, adult head CT across our organization. This was uh, the red plot that you see here is the dose uh, post standardization or after the protocols had been implemented and optimized. So uh, from our perspective over that narrow window of time, significant improvement. 
um, certainly less variability. Uh, most hospitals are now below or within the range that we had set. There are a couple that went higher and we'll address, and we have addressed those, and I'll address some of the reasons in some of the um, subsequent slides. Abdomen and pelvis. Uh, surprisingly, considering the number of hospitals that we have, many were well below, and when you look at the variability of patient size and patient population when you when you uh, performing abdomen and pelvis CTs, uh, many were already within our, our, our expected range, some were above. So post-optimization, you can see less variability, um, moved in closer within a standard range, and again, some above the range, but most all lower. And because of there being different pa patient populations between phase one and phase two data collection, body habit, size, et cetera, we expected some variability. And similar situation with the chest when we started in phase one, uh, most were below the range or within the range we expected. Uh, still variability, which you would expect based on patient body habitus and size. Certainly differences in protocols. And then here you can see we moved, um, moved more hospitals within uh, the expected dose range. Overall results, I think this is a, a good slide to show that the optimization efforts that our hospitals uh, undertook yielded improvement in all three of protocols. So the adult head protocol during our initial data collection or baseline, 49% of them were below the ACR dose index, uh, the 75th percentile. Uh, after the protocol optimization, 84% uh, were below the 75th percentile. So again, uh, we thought excellent results for the effort. And uh, you can see similar results with abdomen, pelvis, and chest, but the uh, greatest potential with us initially, and we learned from our baseline data, was with the head CT. So some of the challenges that we faced throughout the work um, and just general discussion around the process, uh, our, our hospitals were highly engaged. And I can tell you, as mentioned before, when you start to measure something, it will, it will start to improve quickly whether you do anything um, or not. We had hospitals the day we published the initial baseline data reaching out within 10 minutes going, what's going on? Why is my dose so high? When they're really benchmarked against peers and it really told us that uh, they're, they're, uh, they're capturing dose, they're documenting dose, but when you really start to benchmark it within a range, an, an expected range, and when you publish that with peers, uh, it really drives some um, some movement. So we had people within minutes uh, reaching out to know what they needed to do. So some of the work started um, real time. So really high engagement from, from all of our hospitals. I'll ask the question, I met one last night. Um, Kim, where are you? There you are. Um, Kim is, is a CT technologist from one of our hospitals. She and I had not met until last night, although she has participated in all of this work. Is there anyone else from LifePoint? So uh, Kim can certainly tell you about her experience, but uh, what the feedback we got was really high engagement from all of our hospitals, all of our radiologists, all of our technologists, uh, even our physicists were very engaged. Um, and I'll be honest, because I had brought in a constant physics partner to consult with me on this work, uh, that made some of our independent physicists a bit uncomfortable, but uh, we sort of allayed their fears and said, this is an enterprise undertaking that we have. I'm not working with 60 different physics groups. Uh, we couldn't do this over the course of six years, um, and I've got a 90-day window here. So um, the learning collaborators went very well. They were productive, and I think one of the, um, one of the most important components of this, because as I started this, um, this conversation off, this type of setting um, inspires me to do things differently and better. And when we do these learning collaborators, even in a virtual setting, and they're targeted to the right audience with the right material, I can... I can put Olav in front of 400 people. So those learning collaborators are critical to us. And if you make them very um, relevant, very actionable, uh, it will drive results. As I said earlier, the data collection process really engaged the staff. And that's what was interesting to me because I was concerned about all the manual data collection because um, Dr. Brown, when the Joint Commission published their, um, their pre-publication standards, I got dozens of emails from hospitals saying, we gotta have those software tomorrow to comply with the Joint Commission. 
so that was the focus. And I, I had met with Beth from Landauer um, because that's really the focus of a lot of the, a lot of those leaders. Unfortunately, they looked at that and thought, "I got to have this dose. I got to have the software to collect dose." But that really wasn't where we wanted to start. We wanted to understand the intent of the standards and help them apply them to improving care that was delivered for their patients, not just tracking numbers. That was a byproduct to me of the work. So again, the data collection process really engaged the staff in a meaningful way. Uh, we did have very positive response to the protocol changes. We had um, one particular radiologist who had the imaging director call me and say that the protocol that we had sent out was junk and his images were terrible. So we did a little deep dive into that, and frankly, the images that we were looking at were his protocol. It had not been optimized yet, so once, <laughs> once we were able to point that out to him, he sort of got on board, and he liked our protocols a little better. Uh, and some hospitals saw as much as a 50% reduction in their dose through this optimization effort. Challenges, again, of a larger system. Geography is always a challenge. Um, multiple technologists, multiple radiology groups, multiple scanner vendors and types, um, multiple med medical physics providers. Uh, it drives the importance of communication because again, you, to engage uh, your staff in a meaningful way and you're not looking them in the eye, you have to have some accountability. And fortunately, I work for a company who has great leadership. And um, if we had a hospital that wasn't performing in a way that we needed them to, usually a quick email or phone call prompted them to participate in the way that we wanted or needed them to. So uh, driving full participation was very key. We talked a little bit about manual data collection. Uh, some, of the, um, some of the challenges, the pros and cons. Again, I can't um, emphasize enough from my perspective, having the staff uh, engaged really was important. So the manual data collection was important. Uh, would, would I like to have those software? Yes. Will we? Yes, we will. But for this work, I think it really uh, gave the, the appropriate attention. Um, conversely, uh, it also does require staff participation and time. So it was an extra task for an already busy group of people. Um, there were some manual entry errors. Uh, we had a team from uh, Landauer who helped with the analysis of that work and were able to take some of those out. We were able to contact the hospitals and in some case uh, we did have to go back and have data collected again because the data was, was poor and they couldn't be included in the data set. And certainly some missing data formats. The protocol modification process, again, large number of vendors, large number of scanners, and a large number of CT technologists can lead to some expected challenges. We did have some human error when those standard protocols were published. There was a misinterpretation or just a miskeying in those protocols that led to um, uh, a short-term increase in their dose. Uh, once that was identified, uh, there, were, um, there were targeted calls with those hospitals to uh, focus on uh, getting their protocols in line with what the standard was. Future plans and next steps for us is to expand to additional protocols to look at uh, the uh, pediatric population in a different way. I would probably not be so narrow as I was in the initial um, uh, definition uh, of a pediatric head of uh, a newborn to one year old. We're looking at other common adult protocols. Many of our hospitals have signed up for uh, Landauer's CDOS program. Uh, we are continuing to evaluate a standardized dose tracking software for our enterprise. Uh, we are continuing with monthly educational learning collaboratives on dose and dose optimization, not just specific to these protocols. And then we've started working on fluoroscopy doses, and I've got a particular focus in the cardiovascular area there. Uh, these, this is just a list of some of the upcoming monthly learning collaborative topics that are scheduled for our organization. Uh, and I think uh, the feedback, again, that we've gotten has been incredible because we have leading experts in the field uh, do these. Um, Olav has done several of them for us, uh, and we invite the appropriate audience. So if we're talking about um, the Joint Commission and those standards, we invite our quality directors because they have a keen interest. We invite our radiologists, we invite our CT technologists, our imaging leaders. So the learning collaborators are huge for us as an organization. And then in summary, um, for it being a rapid cycle improvement, and again, it may not sound like 
Um, it may not sound so rapid to some of you if you're dealing in an, uh, one, two, or three hospital system, but with the challenges that we faced, I think uh, we were very happy with what we were able to do, and there was considerable dose variability across our organization that we were able to close the gap on. Uh, we did determine and prove that standardization is possible, even with a lot of challenges and complexities, that leadership, organization, and communication are critical. Uh, progress can be made without those tracking software or with whatever tools that you have, whether it's manual or otherwise. And I think it's very important. Um, it always reminds me of uh, our chief medical officer. He, he doesn't like us to talk about best practices because uh, he said if we're focused on what we should be doing as healthcare providers, and that's continuous quality improvement, a best practice will become obsolete today because we're seeking a better way to do it tomorrow. So again, we learned from our process that this was certainly continuous improvement. You don't develop a standard book of protocols and say, here you go. Uh, I think uh, we have the Joint Commission and we have CMS and we have others that are pushing us in a way that we probably should have gone a long time ago as, a as, as healthcare providers. Uh, so uh, the, the lessons learned uh, were, were great for us and I think uh, the process yielded the results that we anticipated and in some cases uh, better results.